and welcome to Book Dreams, the podcast for everyone who loves books and has ever wondered about them. I'm Julie Sternberg, author of a number of children's books, including Like Pickle Juice on a Cookie and its sequels, and the Top Secret Diary of Celie Valentine series. And I'm Eve Yohalem. I'm also a children's book author. My books include The Truth According to Blue and Cast Off, The Strange Adventures of Petra de Winter and Brom Broen. In each episode of this podcast, we consider a book-related question. In this episode, we explore the researching and writing of historical fiction. So I've written a book of historical fiction. Cast Off was historical fiction set in the 17th century. And Julie, I know you are currently doing research for historical fiction. I am. How is that going? Oh, I love it. I love the research <laughs> process. I do. It's the best. The secret is that the research is the best part of the writing, of all writing. It's of really all fun. writing. Right. And I've never done this before, so I don't yet have a good sense of when I will be willing to put away the joys of the research and move to the travails of the writing. But yeah, I'm writing a book that's grounded in my family's history, which was initially going to be a memoir and now, for various reasons, has shifted probably to be more fictionalized version. And the research is so fun. I've been recording conversations with my dad for a while now, um, in which we talk about his past. And then we have old newspaper articles, old letters, letters that are in German from mm -hmm. the time when they were in Germany. So those need to be translated. I've watched movies set in Berlin in the 30s, which is the relevant time period. I mean, they were filmed in Berlin then, which is fascinating. So you get to see the city. That's great. I loved it too. I spent a full year researching for Cast Off before I started writing. And it was the coziest, happiest year <laughs> I, I, I can imagine. You know, I was just following my nose and learning tons of stuff every day and coming to the dinner table with all kinds of fun facts. Like in the 1660s, regular people hadn't started using forks yet. They had made their way to the French nobility, but they hadn't really spread beyond. So I had never thought about when did people actually no. start using forks. And I learned that as part of my research. Were they using spoons or were they using yeah, their hands? Yeah, spoons and knives and, and uh -huh. their hands. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Also, people didn't put their napkins in their laps. They threw them over one shoulder. Ooh. And I used to know which shoulder, but I have forgotten. So like all those tiny details. I didn't know much about the 17th century. I learned a lot. In doing that, it made me more curious about how other authors do their historical research because I was never trained in research techniques. I just sort of winged it. Right. I remember reading that M.T. Anderson, when he was writing Octavian, the Octavian Nothing books, which are set in the 18th century, for the time that he was writing those books, he didn't listen to any music. And I believe he didn't read anything either. I'm not, I might be wrong on that, but I think I'm right, that had been composed or written after the time period of his novel. So for a couple of years, he was just steeped in that period Wow, the music of the era of the American Revolution. Yeah, yeah. I briefly considered trying that because I read this about him while I was working on Cast Off, but I just thought I have to listen to some <laughs> music and read some books that were made after the 1660s. Yeah, I just right. I, I need right. a little more variety. And I'm going to confess here that I've only half been listening what, to what you were saying because I got stuck on the napkins in the lap versus napkins over the shoulder. Like, how did that change transpire, do you think? Like, who? Oh, that's an interesting question. I don't know. And yeah. this is the weird thing about doing research for historical fiction, which is you're not an historian. So the goal isn't to learn everything there is about a period or about a topic. The goal is to learn everything you need to know for your book. I know, but then you get these questions and they won't yes. let go, yes. right? Which is why you never start to write. <laughs> yeah, now, I'm, I, now I think I yeah. need to go looking into the history of napkin use. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, I think for both of us, our own experiences doing research for historical books made us very curious about how other people did it. And that's why we decided to talk to Christina Baker Klein. And did we ever get lucky with this guest? It was so much fun. It, the it interview so is so much fun. I'm so excited for listeners who get to hear it because she tells such great stories. She's so interesting. And it's just a joy to listen to what she has to say. Um, Christina Baker Klein is a number one New York Times bestselling author. She's written eight novels, including The Exiles, which just came out, 
Orphan Train, and A Piece of the World. She's published in 40 countries. Her novels have received the New England Prize for Fiction, the Maine Literary Award, and a Barnes & Noble Discover Award, among other prizes. They've been chosen by hundreds of communities, universities, and schools as one book, one read selections. And her essays, articles, and reviews have appeared in publications like the New York Times, the New York Times Book Review, the Boston Globe, the San Francisco Chronicle, on and on. She's so accomplished, and her books are fantastic. If you haven't read them, you really should. Yes. We started by asking Christina why she thinks historical fiction has been such a successful genre for her. And here's what she said. I think that the stories I'm interested in that are set in the past are stories that reclaim pieces of history that most people aren't familiar with, that have been hidden in plain sight. And what I've noticed about my own interest in writing about the past is that I'm interested in the stories of underrepresented people. The historian Jill Lepore wrote a piece in The New Yorker that really spoke to me called Just the Facts, Ma'am, in which she says that fiction does what history doesn't but should, which is that it tells the story of ordinary men. And then she goes on to ask, and who are these ordinary men? And she answers, well, many of them are women. And when I read that, I realized that that is what I have sort of done unconsciously. And I suppose perhaps it's become more conscious with this new novel. I'm interested in telling the stories of people on the margins of society, the poor, the dispossessed, and women, and how those lives intersect, and also what they say about the narrative that we call history, the perceived truth of the human experience, which is usually written by the conquerors, which tend to be men, let's face it. Just to quickly go back and answer, I think that actually it's a moment when there's a lot of change happening in the country, and it has been true for a while, but I think part of that change is about looking at stories that have been neglected. It just so happened that Orphan Train came out and then came into a world of a lot of foment around immigration. Yeah. And Orphan Train is about immigrants to this country, immigrants who today are considered the bedrock of the country, right? Today, when I'm talking about that book, only the nationalities have changed. Now we talk about Muslims and Mexicans, but 120 years ago, those were the Irish. And now you've written a book about criminal justice in the exiles, which also is somewhat serendipitous, unfortunately, with respect to an issue that's really tearing the country apart. The book takes place in the mid-19th century, but all the issues of, as you say, criminal justice reform, of the rights of indigenous people, and also in our country, African-Americans, and women's progress, all of those are at the forefront of many conversations at the moment. You were writing contemporary fiction for a while. Was there anything in particular that inspired the shift to stories that are either largely set in the distant past or entirely set there? It was definitely a slippery slope. I didn't think when I started Orphan Train or when I wrote Orphan Train that it would be a departure for me in the way it's become. And frankly, the book after that, A Piece of the World, takes place in the 1940s, which doesn't really seem historical to me, but I guess it is. No, I think it counts. Yeah, it does. (laughs) Yeah, I know it counts. It counts, but it didn't feel like I was writing quote unquote, historical fiction, which by the way, I have issues with as a phrase, I think it can be a female ghetto. Mm. Mm. Many male writers who write novels set in the past from Salman Rushdie forward, Ewan McEwen are not called historical novelists and or their novels are not called historical novels. But to go back to your question about how I came to write about the past, my husband's grandfather was featured in a local newspaper article in North Dakota many, many, many years ago about orphan train riders. And his family never knew. He never told his children or anyone. My mother-in-law never heard about it. My husband never knew about it. And it was only when she received this centennial celebration of her hometown, Jamestown, North Dakota, filled with newspaper articles from the past, that she stumbled on this story. And she was actually 
going through this volume and reading it to my then eight-year-old son. And she found the story and thought it was interesting and turned the page. And there was a picture of her father there. Oh, wow. So this was a big moment, yeah, for her family. Was her father still living when she saw the article so that she could ask him about it? Not only was he dead, but everyone was dead. All his siblings, he had three sisters and a brother, all of whom were also in this article. And she had grown up, my mother-in-law, in the town where they had been dropped off and still lived. And none of the sisters told her, none of her aunts. There was such a stigma about being an orphan train rider that there was a taboo about talking about it. What's so interesting, though, is that in the Midwest at that time, there was a lot of an influx of immigrants. And people came in all kinds of scraggly ways. <laughs> there were so many stories, like, for example, these five children ended up going to Jamestown having been orphaned. But their brother, who had what appears to be Down syndrome, was put into what was literally called at the time, the home for the feeble-minded. Oh, and he wow. spent the rest of his life there. And no one ever spoke about him. Nobody knew about him until after everyone died. And my mother-in-law's friend was doing genealogical research and she found this other sibling. So there were just so many secrets at the time. Right. Were people willing to talk about it when you were doing your research? You know, I hit this topic at a really lucky moment because the descendants of train riders have become quite passionate about the subject. And of course, this is how it works with history. And it's true of the Australians who were descended from convicts. For several generations, it was such a shameful part of the past for them. And it was such, as I said, a taboo subject that they tried to assimilate as quickly as they could and to not talk about it and to purge all references to it. But now... In both cases, the descendants are very proud of both their convict past in Australia and of um, their orphan train past in America. So I had all these people who were really eager to discuss it. Furthermore, the train riders themselves who were still alive when I began the book were willing to talk. I interviewed, I met 11 of them. I went to four train rider reunions, largely led by the younger generations. When I began Orphan Train, there were 150 living train riders. And when I finished the book, there were only 25 left oh my at goodness. all. Now there are none. It's incredible. Right. Yeah. That wow. I got to be a part of living history and speak to people who had actually been on the trains was such a gift. You've mentioned that you've spoken to the descendants of a lot of these folks who initially keep secrets. So the children of the prisoners, the children of the orphans on the orphan train. Mm -hmm. Do any of the descendants talk to you about the effect of that secret keeping on them? Very much so. The most interesting event I ever did was actually in California. I had about 400 people in the audience I had done a lot of events in California and had always found that there was usually a descendant of an orphan train rider in the audience. It just happened to be. And at this particular event, someone asked that question about the legacy of trauma. And I asked if there were any descendants of train riders and four people stood up and they all to a person talked about their difficult childhoods and their parents who had been quite complicated as parents. And that was one of the things that was true about my husband's grandfather. He was almost silent. He was stern. He didn't talk about the past at all. He was um, quite shut off from his emotions. The four people who stood up talked about that. They had had a real legacy of trauma and even, you know, abuse. I think that's part of the interest in these kinds of stories Mm. is being able to look at the past and see patterns that continue. Sure. So I would love to return for a minute to your research process. Can you tell us what your research process is like? The research is really fun. It's really a fun, immersive process. The writing is so hard. Yeah. Um, I work really hard to 
pare back to make the story primary and the research secondary. Mm-hmm. I mean, of course, people who read my novels are learning something about the past because I've done, obviously done all this work with tons of reading, taking a bazillion notes, interviewing people, going places. I went to Glasgow, London, Tunbridge Wells, the north of England. I went to Australia twice, Melbourne, Sydney, and Tasmania to the prisons and to libraries and museums. And the research process is pretty immersive. But when it comes to then writing the book, only the salient details should remain. Um, That's the hardest part is pairing back. The research itself is pretty exciting. I had all these documents. And in the end, I hammered out a 50-page single-spaced document of sort of the timeline of my story with the relevant research documents. And then I went from there and started writing. But once you start writing, you have to keep researching too, because stuff comes up. Yeah. You don't realize (laughs) that you need to know what the bustle looked like on a dress in 1840 or exactly the sort of texture of what the convicts wore, their coarse cloth and all of that. So you've said that when writing about people from different eras, you're less interested in verisimilitude than in exploring the ways that the past resembles the present. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit more about that? What I really want is for readers to feel immersed in the story to the extent that it feels as if they're living it almost. For example, the dialogue in The Exiles is not exactly what people spoke like the cadence of language from the 1840s. It's Mm -hmm. sort of a hybrid of today's voice, language, whatever, and the past. When I was young, I had an English accent. I know you don't hear it now, but I feel like I have a pretty good ear for that. I don't like to use dialect, but I did it in the structure of the sentences. And there was one word, which was you, which was for some of my characters was Y-E. That was the only kind of nod to kind of accent. I tried not to use anachronistic language. I did a lot of etymology research on words and phrases. I did get one thing wrong that someone just pointed out. I had it right and then I changed it and now I regret Uh. it. (laughs) So you know the chicken little, chicken little as a concept, the sky is Mm -hmm. falling, right? In America, even in the 1840s, Chicken Little was a thing, and they called it her Chicken Little, but in England, they called her Henny Penny, and I changed it to Chicken Little because I thought, oh, nobody will know what Henny Penny is, but of course, now I regret it because it was not quite accurate. I really did try to be accurate with most of those details, but um, I love that Hilary Mantel wrote that she wanted these characters from the English past to seem as if they live today. And that's what I feel too. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. But of course our society does shape the way that we think. So, you know, current views of unwed mothers in Brooklyn, you know, is going to differ dramatically from views in London in 1840, which is when the exile starts out. So How do those kinds of differences affect your exploration of the way that the past resembles the present? Oh, gosh, that's such a great question. I wrote with a contemporary sensibility. Obviously, I exist today. If someone had written this story in the 19th century, it would be a different story with a different Mm -hmm. emphasis. The thing I tried really hard to avoid, though, was I didn't want to be anachronistic in that way. I didn't want to impose my own wishful thinking in terms of the enlightenment. I didn't want to impose enlightenment on characters who would not have been thinking that way. But I was lucky in that a lot of those convict women were sort of renegades already in real life. They were rebels. A lot of them wore pantaloons instead Mm -hmm. of dresses. Mm -hmm. And they had not adhered to society's norms. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been picked up and put on a convict ship. My character of Evangeline was sort of a way into the story for the reader because she's learned, she's well-read, she has no familiarity with the convict system. So she was quite shocked and flabbergasted by it in a way that people who existed in that world already, some of my other characters, were not. You know, they were quite jaded about it at that point. And I tried to show with 
both the reaction of people to Evangeline's pregnancy and the reaction of white people to the character of Mathina, who is an Aboriginal girl, eight years old, when the story begins, that othering is imposed from the outside. Mm -hmm. In other words, there is a lot of judgment, but it comes from characters who would have been judgmental in that way and from a kind of society that was judgmental. But the characters themselves, Mathina, for example, I wanted to show that she was not internalizing this message, but she was having to grapple with it. One of the things that I loved about the book is that you did tell the story from multiple points of view, because by seeing the story through Mathina's eyes, that othering that you're talking about, it's clear that it's happening from the outside. But writing about characters from different cultures and races from one's own is always complicated. What kinds of challenges did you find in telling Mathina's story? It was incredibly challenging. There's a question about whether what happened to the Aboriginal Tasmanians was genocide, but the fact is that they were systematically in my view, exterminated through disease, you know, the way it happened to Native Americans in here. Um, the English came in and stole the land and wanted to shunt the Aboriginal people off the land. And at one point, there was even a shoot to kill policy because the Aboriginal people didn't want their hunting grounds to be fenced off with sheep. So by the time my novel starts, the few remaining Aboriginal people in Tasmania have been essentially put in a concentration camp called Flinders Island, a prison, an open air prison. The real life story is that there was this little girl and the governor of Hobart and his wife, Sir John and Lady Jane Franklin, they saw her dancing and thought it would be kind of fun to take her in on a whim as a social experiment. So that's all true and documented. Mm -hmm. And I read everything I could get my hands on about that true story. And the more I researched the period, the more I felt it would be irresponsible not to include the story of the Aboriginal people to some extent, because I couldn't tell the story of the convict women without, without addressing it. And at the same time that I understand it's a incredibly complicated for me to do so. Mm -hmm. And I was very cognizant of that as I wrote it. The other really complicated thing about the real life Mathena story is that at the age of 17, she drowned. It's described as either a puddle or a pond. I'm not sure how it could have been a puddle, but um, mm. she either was murdered or committed suicide. Some accounts say that she had become an alcoholic and was drunk. And her story ended tragically because the Franklins up and left back to London and abandoned her. And she was caught between worlds. She was never able to assimilate with her own people again. And the white people, you know, scorned her. So she was sort of a wandering figure. And I wrote the most sensitive and thoughtful portrayal of her that I could. And, and I had a lot of readers this incredible professor of Aboriginal studies who's himself descended from the tribe she was in, who was super helpful. And he's consulted with other writers and museums and, and a few others as well who read it. But I wrote the story I could write. Many of the quotes in the book that are from the Franklins and other people are real quotes from them and from people in their world. Wow. So, for example, when they take her in, Sir John says, well, why not? In London, I hear they're teaching orangutans to dance. Yeah. And he said that in real life. Oh, God. It's just appalling. Yeah, it's appalling. And I tried to write those pieces just simply by showing what these people said and also trying to show how Mathena felt about that. Yeah. Um. After Orphan Train came out and became a bestseller, you were asked whether you felt pressure to recreate that commercial success, and you said, no, absolutely not. This is going to be my one and only hit. I'm paraphrasing here. <laughs> Correct me if I'm yeah. wrong. I don't feel bad about it. And you said, like, my next book, it's quiet, it's interior, it's about a woman who essentially never leaves her house. And that book was A Piece of the World, which was an instant New York Times bestseller. So my question is, how are you feeling now? Did your second instant bestseller 
change the pressure that you felt as you wrote The Exiles? And how does your past success affect you as a writer? If I had written a piece of the world before Orphan Train, <laughs> I don't think it would have had that long tail. I know it wouldn't have. It has more in common with my earlier novels, actually. My publisher was not so thrilled that I said that. <laughs> they were like, did you really need to say that, you, <laughs> that this book is not appealing? <laughs> but I actually felt so freaked out about that experience in some ways that I wanted to tell a very interior story. And to their credit, they were like, all right, <laughs> that's okay, you can do that. <laughs> I'm really proud of A Piece of the World. I think, I think I managed to do what I was hoping to do in it. And I will say that A Piece of the World did very well, but Orphan Train is still definitely did way better. Uh-huh. Mm. Who knows what will happen with the exiles? I mean, I feel like I've had that experience once in a lifetime and I, I'm not reaching for it again. And to be honest with you, I would wake up cringing. It felt weird to be, I don't know. I mean, I'm in a community of writers. All my friends are writers, not all, but many. And we were all writing midlist fiction and it was okay. We're all cobbling lives together of teaching and editing and doing other jobs and writing and children and all that. And, you know, suddenly that book took off and I just wasn't prepared for it. And I felt really guilty about it, actually. It wasn't a very good feeling, that part of it. I mean, I've moved on. It's now in the past. And I can say I'm glad that it happened. But it was strange. I'm trying to write the best books I can. And I liked getting the random response from a reader. That felt good. And it felt strange to have this bigger response. That's a very interesting perspective and one that's much appreciated from this mid-list writer. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I never aspired to that. I know. Listen, my publisher, when I handed in the book, I remember there was a, like a media meeting and I remember someone saying in the meeting, uh, you know, we're not sure about this book because really your demographic is like 30 to 50 year old women and you have this cranky old lady and this disaffected 17 year old. And it's just, we don't think we're hitting your demographic here. I remember them saying that. And there were not great expectations for the book. I got a modest advance that I think we had to fight for. I'm like, very (laughs) modest. It just unfolded so slowly. Even the publisher, they got behind it, but it was like, way after it had been published. And, you know, I think that they saw there was some momentum, like Target bought a bunch of copies and everyone was like, what? That's bizarre. Okay, cool. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I will say the one delightful thing about that novel that will never happen again is that every single morning when I woke up, there was some little adrenaline pellet, little burst of news that like, oh my God, it's number 212 on the USA Today list. That's incredible. Everything (laughs) was new. And so as it inched up the list, it didn't hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list for almost a year. I mean, it was crazy. After publication, it just inched up. So then over time, as it sort of snowballed, it was really surprising to everyone. (laughs) It wasn't like a manufactured bestseller the way I know, I realize now that the publisher can really get behind a book. Mm -hmm. And that was a book that just, it was word of mouth. It was very strange experience. I have to say, I find that very inspiring, this idea that a book can come out in the world and then slowly grow and become more and more successful. Because I think conventional wisdom is more like, oh, you've got three weeks. And if you haven't done it by then, you're toast. This is really a very hopeful story. It is hopeful. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why it's hopeful. Because it was the last, I really thought I might never publish again. Mm -hmm. And my career before that had been completely up and down. My first novel, you know, I got $7,500 for. It was turned down by a whole bunch of people. And then it was a modest success. You know, like we were Barnes and Noble Discover Award winner and da, 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 da. They gave me a reasonable five-figure advance for the next one, which totally flopped. And then (laughs) I could barely get a contract for, I mean, it's just my whole career has been that way until, Mm -hmm. until Orphan Train. So, you know, look, I've been doing this for a long time. I'm glad it wasn't my first book because I really know how the world of publishing works. (laughs) Right. And I guess the thing that I think people could learn from about Orphan Train is that if you keep at it, 
even when you're not expecting it, something like that can happen. And it might happen in a way that you don't expect at all. Here I am with this like lame paperback original, not many high hopes for it. And for some reason it caught the public imagination. I love these stories of the overnight, quote unquote, success. Oh my God. Yeah, like she's never written in anything before. She just emerged. Just on amazing, an instant <laughs> sensation. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a very inspiring story, though. I mean, you know, we've is. had another episode talking about what makes a bestseller and how important all the work of the publisher is beforehand and, you know, all the marketing. And yet sometimes books just find their way. Right, right. That is, of course... One great hope that keeps writers going, you know. Yeah. One thing she said about the actual writing of historical fiction that really resonated with me was this idea of pairing back. You know, you do gobs and gobs of research, and then what ultimately makes it into the book is just the bare minimum of what you need. And do you think it would be interesting or helpful if we gave people an example of how that works on the page? Oh, I love that idea. Okay. On page three of Cast Off, I'm just going to read a few sentences and then go back and tell you where the research is so people get a sense of how it works. Um, Petra is one of the two protagonists, she, and she lives with her father and their housekeeper, who's like a second mother to her, Albertina. And Albertina is a healer. Petra has been learning some of her techniques, and the story opens with Cor, the baker's apprentice, shows up with a burn on his hand, and Petra has to treat it. And so Albertina says to her, what will you use? Honey and soap to take the burn out, then an oil of rose plaster for the mending, I said, smearing on the first. Cor was trying to be brave, but if he chewed that lip any harder, I'd be stitching it up next. Albertina dunked the hen into a pot of boiling water in the hearth, while I spread the plaster and wrapped Cor's hand in linen. He left with his usual idiot's grin back in place, but I faced the empty pots and felt the bile drain from my spleen. Mm. I unpacked hunks of meat, ropes of blood sausage, a pile of spiny artichokes, yellow butter sweated in a pewter dish next to a spray of crimson coxcomb flowers. Beneath the table, a leaf of onion paper dirtied the black and white checkerboard floor. Now I'll go back and annotate. So honey and soap for the burn, oil of rose plaster for the healing. So I had to research medical techniques of the 17th century. She dunked the hen into the pot of boiling water. Well, I had to research... When you go buy a chicken in Amsterdam in the 1660s, do you buy it with the feathers on or off? And if you bring it home with the feathers, how do you pluck a chicken? Because I had no idea how to pluck a chicken. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> she feels the bile drain from her spleen. People still believed in Galenic medicine, this idea of humors. And so that was an expression that someone would have used back then. And then, of course, all the food she bought, that's all of the period. And then I researched what would be in season because you can't buy out of season anything back then. Mm. The pewter dish was something I researched. And the coxcomb flowers came from, I had a painting of the time and it showed these red flowers and I had to research what kind of flowers they were because I wanted to make sure I was using flowers that were readily available at the time. Right. And then the last piece was the black and white checkerboard floor, which I saw in a number of paintings. And also I traveled to Amsterdam and went to a bunch of historical house museums. And those floors were very common. And specifically, I went to a house museum of a wealthy merchant. And that's Petra's background. Her father is a wealthy merchant. And that was the floor of that house. So it's a nothing of a scene, but that's how much wow, research went into that's it. That's incredible. Yeah. That's what Christina was talking about. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. I have to say, I, I've read and loved that book, but having this peek into everything that went into every word, it just raises my respect even more. That's incredible. Oh, well, thank you. Well, I hope that everyone else found this, all of this as fascinating as I did. And I think that's it for this episode of the Book Dreams podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Please subscribe if you haven't already. And if you like the podcast and think someone else would too, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player. Be sure to let us know if there's a book-related topic you've wondered about, and we'll try looking into it in a future episode. You can reach us for that reason or any other at contact at bookdreamspodcast.com. We're also on Twitter at bookdreamspod and on Instagram at bookdreamspodcast. Many thanks to our associate producer, Gianfranco Lentini, and to our theme music composer, Maya Polsky. You can find Eve at eveohallam.com and me at juliesternberg.com. 
and check out the podcast website, www.bookdreamspodcast.com. Until next time, happy book dreaming. Happy book dreaming. Love, come listen to Book Dreams with Julianne.